this does, conversation does not start with Christian conservatives versus Christian progressives. It goes all the way back, I would say, at least in the American sense, back to a dispute between two philosophers named John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, John Locke said, humans have a sin nature, and if you put people into power and you don't hold them accountable, they will become corrupt. Rousseau said, on the other hand, now, humans don't have a sin nature. We're all basically pure. Two different revolutions came out of that. So oh. you can see right there how what you believe about God and human nature affects everything else. And it could lead you toward a stable society or toward a chaotic, horrifying mm -hmm. one. Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast. I have a return guest for us today, Dr. Jeff Myers. And the reason he's coming on today is we are actually, for the, I think the first time on this podcast, we are going to tackle the topic of politics. And I want to share a little bit about why I want to broach this subject. So when I first started a podcast and my YouTube channel, even my blog, it was very important to me that I, I wanted to not get political. I wanted to focus on the core claims of historic Christianity, and that's what I've, for the most part, done. Although it's been very interesting to me that when theology tends to intersect with what people perceive to be politics, I've received emails and even feedback saying, hey, you're getting too political. And that caused me to scratch my head because in my view, I was just making theological claims. I'm talking about the Christian worldview. And so what I'm beginning to realize is that it's virtually impossible to be completely apolitical, especially if you're a Christian, because your theology is going to drive your politics. And so in an attempt to think better about this, and for me, even for myself, to think more deeply about it, I've invited uh, my friend, Dr. Jeff Myers, who's given this topic quite a bit of thought to come on and just give us a little bit of what we're going to call a theology of politics. The purpose of this episode is not to endorse a candidate, it's not to tell you who to vote for, but it's to help us all to think better about politics, and here's why. Because as I discovered, as those lines become more and more blurred, what I don't want to happen is for politics to get in the driver's seat because we're trying so hard to avoid it, that can actually cause us to make decisions based on politics. And what I mean is that sometimes I'll be about to, you know, I want to say something and I'll think, oh, well, this is going to be perceived as political, so maybe I shouldn't say it. And that's not a good way to think. That's not a good way to approach how we think about theology and politics and how those things intersect. So this episode is essentially, originally, I asked Dr. Jeff, hey, I'd love to talk to you sometime about your thinking regarding politics. And then I thought, why not invite everybody else to, to listen in and just to challenge all of us to think more deeply about how we as Christians are to engage politically. We have listeners from all over the world. So this isn't, we were going to talk a little bit about politics in America, but this is going to be universally applicable because as Christians, we are the body of Christ. And the Bible has some things to say about politics. Actually, Jesus had some things to say about politics. So I'm really excited to get into this conversation. Dr. Jeff, welcome. Thanks for coming back on the podcast. Thanks, Elisa. Well, you're very brave to tackle such a difficult topic, one that's sure a lightning rod, but I think we're going to have a lot of fun and hopefully it'll be light as well as he Yes, hopefully nobody will be too mad at us. But I but it's really true what I said. I I have found myself in the past getting ready to say something that that to me is just a biblical point, but you think, oh, with the way the world has gotten so crazy and so just difficult to navigate, this is going to be perceived as something political. For example, something you might say about, now I've not shied away from talking about pro-life. I'm very much pro-life and I have no hesitation talking about that. Uh, but things like marriage and laws surrounding that and how that affects 
uh, people and how that affects the world. We have to think about those things. We can't just avoid you know, politics and crawl in a, in a hole and just pretend like nothing is going on. So we're going to talk about all that today. Uh, but you are the president of Summit Ministry. So take just a couple minutes and let our viewers and listeners know what you do. And you've got some really exciting opportunities going on for this summer for students. Let us know about that. Yeah, so Summit Ministries does two things. We equip and we support the rising generation to embrace God's truth and to champion a biblical worldview. Now, these young adults are headed off to a college or university. You know from watching the news that this is a really tough place to be a Christian who takes a stand on anything at all. So students come for two weeks to our campus here in this little hippie town of Manitou Springs, Colorado, or on our campus on the uh, beautiful Covenant College up on Lookout Mountain, Georgia. And in that two weeks, they meet with Christian thought leaders. Uh, I think you're, you're going to be one of our speakers, Sean McDowell, Jay Warner Wallace, Frank Turek, a lot of the people you've had on your program, instruct the students, spend one-on-one -on -one time with them, they students meet in small groups. They learn to get answers to their difficult questions and develop a strong sense of conviction about their faith and the courage to be able to articulate it in a compassionate but compelling way in the culture that they're moving into. Mm -hmm. So these programs are available all summer long. Students are signing up right now at summit.org. And if you know a young adult, 16 to 22, this could be an opportunity for them to develop an unshakable faith this summer. Awesome. Great. So uh, summit.org, right? That's the, that's the yes. link you're going to go to. All right. Fantastic. Well, okay, let's just dive into this. Now, I always like to start by defining our terms. So, mm -hmm. Jeff, what is politics? Politics means the rule of a city. It's very simple. That's It comes from a Greek word. The, the idea of politics is truth applied to community, where we ask a lot of questions in our society, but the main political question is, how do we develop an orderly and sustainable means of community that promotes human flourishing? Mm. So nothing controversial about it so far. Shouldn't be, right? <laughs> so if, if we define theology, and tell me if you agree with this definition broadly, theology is what you think about God. It's the study of God. And so how would you say theology and politics intersect? At what point do they intersect? And when is it just where we can't avoid talking about politics if we're Christians? Well, you know, uh, Thomas Aquinas said theology is the queen of the sciences and philosophy, by which he meant natural philosophy or science and anything else, is merely its handmaiden. Uh, so theology is at the top. Everything flows from our theology. What you believe about God will determine what you believe about the nature of reality itself. What you believe about reality determines what you believe about what is right and wrong. What you believe about what is right and wrong will determine how you live in community. And that's where politics comes into play. Justice, law, all of these other things also fit in. But politics is the, the rule of a, a city. So, so how do we do that? What difference does it make whether we rule based on an understanding that God exists and truth can be discovered versus the idea that uh, the, the truth can't be discovered. So this doesn't. This does, conversation does not start with Christian conservatives versus Christian progressives. It goes all the way back. I would say, at least in the American sense, back to a dispute between two philosophers named John Locke and Jean Jacques Rousseau. Uh, John Locke said, "Humans have a sin nature, and if you put people into power and you don't hold them accountable, they will become corrupt." Rousseau said, on the other hand. Now, humans don't have a sin nature. We're all basically pure. If we do anything bad, it's because society made us do it. So if we organize society well, then everyone will be prosperous and healthy and happy and pure. And, and so two different revolutions came out of that. The American Revolution came out of the ideas from John Locke that we, we need to have freedom and we, we need to have liberty. And then when we develop a government, it needs to take into account God's existence, the truths discussed in scripture, and the reality of sin. The French Revolution went the other direction. They followed Rousseau and said, we're pure. Therefore, we are the ones who automatically get to judge our enemies. 40,000 people lost their heads in Paris. The blood literally ran down the streets of Paris. And ultimately, the revolution petered out because the revolutionaries 
couldn't figure out who among them were the purest. And so they began killing mm. each other. Like the guy who invented and started using the guillotine, but not the guy who invented the guillotine, but the guy who invented using it for political purposes, Robespierre ended up getting killed on the guillotine because he wasn't sufficiently pure, even though he was the one who essentially started the revolution. So oh. you can see right there how what you believe about God and human nature affects everything else. And it could lead you toward a stable society or toward a chaotic, horrifying mm. one. Wow. Okay. So that is really fascinating because what you've just put your finger on is exactly the divide between what we might call historic Christians and progressive Christians. Historically, Christians have believed that we have a fallen nature, right? It goes back to original sin. We 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 are inherently bent toward sin. And whereas in progressive Christianity, they're going to deny that. They're going to deny that you have a sin nature, or at least certainly they're going to deny that your sin would separate you from God. So people are basically good. And wow, it's so fascinating to see how that trickles down into our different uh, views on politics. And one of the things that I think through um, is, you know, I want to acknowledge that there are uh, some really bad expressions of we're, you know, being involved in politics from some Christians on both sides. Um, but, you know, I want to acknowledge, I, I said this in the episode we had on Christian nationalism, that I attended a church with uh, some fr uh, some people close to me on a, on a holiday, and the pastor's sermon was incredibly confusing. You know, I want to acknowledge that. I, he was conflating gospel points with how we should think about masks. He was conflating uh, the resurrection of Jesus with uh, how we should be thinking about police reform. And so a lot of—I remember leaving thinking, you know, if I wasn't a Christian, I would probably think that in order to be a Christian, I have to— think a certain way about masks. I have to think a certain way about vaccines. And I think what you know, when I was pondering that, I want to acknowledge that, I, that, you know, that kind of stuff is out there. There's definitely that kind of stuff out there. But what I also see is that so many of my cons conservative Christian friends who might state an opinion that's political, even though they're not conflating the gospel with it, but they're just saying, look, as Christians, I want to advocate for this because it's better for other people. It's more it's more biblical in the sense that it, like you said, lends to human flourishing, not that we're trying to establish, you know, a, 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 a monarchy with, you know, or what what is it called? The... Um, the word is escaping me. The theocracy. theocracy. We're not trying to establish a theocracy yeah. in that sense, but they're afraid to say something because if you express a conservative political opinion, you're going to be called a Christian nationalist, right? And so I think that part of the reason I want to untie some of these knots for us is because I think we have to just set that aside. People are going to call you all sorts of things, right? And, and of course, acknowledging that there are bad expressions of Christians doing politics in the world. But I want to talk about what the Bible has to say about it. So what is yeah. the biblical case? for Christians being involved in politics? Or is there a biblical case for Christians getting involved politically? You know, the founders of the United States of America wrestled a lot with that question. So once again, it's comforting to know that we're not the first generation to have to do so. They, as Wilfred McClay, who's a, a wonderful history professor, and prob probably my favorite historian right now from the University of Oklahoma, he's a distinguished professor there. He said their, their goal was to develop a government that that was built with the crooked timber of selfish humanity in mind but they recognized mm. if if it's really true as lord acton later said that that uh the power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely if that's really true then how do we take into account sin nature and it's interesting when the founders were looking at this question and they were overwhelmingly Christian of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence, 51 and possibly 53 were known to be Christian and members of a Christian denomination. In fact, the historian Donald Lutz examined 15,000 documents from the founding era and found that the, the Bible was quoted uh, many, many, many more times more than the next nearest document in justifying what the founders were doing. And so what were they doing? Why were they looking at scripture? 
Well, here's the interesting thing, because people use the term theocracy. They say ancient Israel was a theocracy. God, God was in charge and we're just going to rule on behalf of God. But it wasn't really. What they talked about, in fact, they called the, seven, the 1700s the biblical century because people were so interested in going back and examining scripture. And what they realized was the ancient Hebrew system was actually a republic. It was, and they, they thought, well, let's, let's, let's look at that because we could look at Greece, we could look at Rome. Yes, we can learn some good lessons from them, but let's look at the ancient Hebrews they had a system where people had the ability to make decisions. There was governance at a local level. The laws were clearly outlined. Penalties for the laws were clearly outlined. Everybody understood what was going on. There was no one person who was in power over anyone else. And that's what the founders decided they would begin to do. So they applied the Old Testament. Then when you look at the New Testament, you see, well, a couple of things. Jesus lived in a very political era. Jesus lived in an era where there were probably five different groups, and this is probably take a whole show to talk about what all they were working on and what they were interested in doing. But when Jesus took his followers to Caesarea Philippi, which they this they would have remembered this very clearly because it's a big hike. It would be like running a marathon to go up there. And Caesarea Philippi was a place where, where there was Greek pagan worship taking place and worship of the Roman civil government taking place. And Jesus asked them, who do, who do people say that I am? And the disciples began giving responses. Oh, they say, you're sort of like John the Baptist. You know, you're sort of the leave town and just shake the dust off your hands and forget society kind of person. So others say that you are like Elijah, who was thought to be the hero of the zealots. We're going to overthrow the government. And, and then Jesus asked them, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, uh, blessed are you, Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, gates of Hades will not prevail against it. There's so much interesting stuff there. If you go to Caesarea Philippi, you can see exactly what he was talking about. But you realize right away, Jesus was saying, wherever people go to worship politically, wherever people go to worship religiously, that is where you guys are going to go build my church. So you're to be right in the center of everything. And the Apostle Paul talked about this. It came up, of course. They lived in a time when they didn't have a republic. The average citizens didn't have the opportunity to have their say. And he said, obey the governing authorities in Romans chapter 13. You know, I always thought that as an American. So I'm speaking as an American right now in the American context. But, you know, our President Abraham Lincoln said, we have government of the people, by the people, for the people. So if you're going to obey the governing authorities, who is that? It's you. It's me. It's not the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. who are our leaders. We are the leaders. And our founders gave us a constitution that outlined a Republican form of government. If you want to obey God, you have to be an involved citizen. Mm. So I don't know if that helps, but, you know, in yeah. five or six minutes, that's kind of the biblical case. So let's zoom in on Jesus a little bit, because I hear a couple of differing views on Jesus. I've heard some people say Jesus wasn't political at all. And then on the other side of things, you hear people say, well, Jesus was a socialist. He was abdicating for pacifism and socialism. So let's tackle that first one. Was Jesus political or was he apolitical, like some people think he might have been? Jesus came to earth and had his earthly ministry in a time where politics and theology intertwined a whole lot more than mm -hmm. they do now. So his statements, several of his statements, you can see that Jesus was quite aware of the political situation of his day when he said things like, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, give unto God what is God's. But there were there were several different groups in Jesus' day that he was having to interact with on a daily basis. One of them was the Herodians. These were the secular Jewish elites. They were very wealthy, and they made their play for power by playing to Rome, trying to gain the favor of Rome. Then you had the Pharisees who were saying, wow, the reason God punished us in the past is because we did not faithfully follow his commands. And so we're going to list them all out, all 513 of them, and we're going to follow them exactly. And then God will be forced to uh, 
to come and, and restore us to power. Then there were the Essenes. These were the people who said, forget it. I hate all of you. I'm just leaving and going to bury, literally go out into the desert and, and avoid society. Uh, then you had the Zealots. We, I, we know there are only a few of us, but we're going to gain the power and overthrow Rome, just like uh, Mac, the Maccabees, Judas Maccabees did several hundred years before. Uh, so you have all of these groups that are competing in this, in this time for attention. And, and what Jesus does is really give us a sense of, of how our spiritual lives and our daily lives interact and, and fit together. The idea that Jesus was a revolutionary is fairly new. That mm -hmm. came along probably in the 1960s, and you've done a lot of, of research on this and have shared it in past podcasts. But it goes back to the idea of liberation theology, that because Jesus often addressed the poor, Scripture very often addresses the concerns of the poor and, and, and focuses on justice. Because he did that, then we will say that Jesus' ministry was about the poor. He came as a political revolutionary to free the poor from their bonds so that they could take control of society. So you, you can't really look at the ministry of Jesus and say, thus saith the Lord, this is the political agenda of our time. But you can't really look at the ministry of Jesus either and say that he was a political revolutionary. None of that makes sense of the gospel accounts. Or the un, or the cultural context in which Jesus came. Mm. Okay, so let's let's talk about America in in particular because it's you know it's it's really rough right now in America just with the division. Everybody's fighting. It seems so tribalistic right now. Um, it it honestly, if I'm totally honest, it just makes me want to completely retreat from anything that even smells of politics, because it's just all so just odious to me, you know? Now, I still vote, of course, and I think most people listening to this podcast, even if they're not sure about how to engage publicly or how to, you know, engage in conversations and things, everybody's got an opinion, right? Everybody is going to end up voting. Um, but I, I, one of the things I wanted you to maybe expound upon a little bit is the question, why should Christians be involved in America? Like, because here's the thing, you know, you have some people saying, and I, I'll admit, I, I sort of lean this way, where you want to just say, you know what, I'm just going to get ready to suffer if if my Christian beliefs become persecuted, you, you know, if because right now, of course, we're not— Everybody always says if you talk about how your beliefs are being silenced, then you have a persecution complex. I'm not. I don't have a persecution complex. Um, I don't believe I'm persecuted for my beliefs yet. I think the time could come. I think we're seeing that in other nations, and certainly I do have friends uh, who have been actually persecuted for their beliefs. Our friend Frank Turek lost a job over a book he wrote on marriage. So you know that kind of thing does definitely happen. Um, but you know. Part of me just wants to be like, let it all burn. I'm just going to get over here, get ready to suffer. I'm just going to speak, keep speaking the truth and not engage politically at all. Um, but you have a different view. Your your view, and I'm I'm I think that you probably are going to be able to persuade me to to speak a little bit more. But why should Christians be involved in politics, particularly in America right now? Well, I always start with this with my students. Remember that there's no such thing as neutral. Yeah. When I was in college and I was coming to faith in Christ, I, I would often hear from my friends, well, you're a Christian, so you have a viewpoint. I'm not, so I'm neutral. Mm. And I realized very quickly, a religion is any set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. And I learned to say to my friends, you are just as religious as I am. You're not neutral. So if Christians fail to get involved, People from other worldviews, mm. non-Christian worldviews, counterfeit worldviews will fill the vacuum. And what do they believe primarily? Well, the core belief of a secularist or, he, as, or a Marxist, I know that you've had different people on who've talked about that. The core belief of those thought systems is that only the material world exists. Just It's the, just the physical. That's all there is. There's no God, there's no Jesus, there's no Holy Spirit, there's no heaven, there's no hell. There's no, there's no world outside of the physical world. Even just justice is whatever we want it to be. Politics is whatever we want it to be, whatever we decide. And the we is always those who are interested enough to try to gain power 
to get their viewpoint onto other people. This is why way, way, way back, you know, almost more than 1500 years ago, Augustine of Hippo said when he wrote this book called City of God Against the Pagans, he said, in essence, the citizen of the kingdom of God will always be the best citizen of the kingdom of man because he has an allegiance to something higher than the state. Now, think about how profound that is when you look back at the experience of the 20th century. Uh, I know people are really tired of talking about Adolf Hitler, but this is really significant. If there's nothing higher, if only the physical world exists, only the material world exists, if there is nothing higher than humanity, then the most powerful person is God. Okay? And whatever they do is right. In Nazi Germany, whatever Adolf Hitler did was considered to be legal because he was the law. Whatever was done to oppose him was considered to be illegal because he was the law. And it is Christians who have the conviction that no person is God. No one has the right to do that. God is God, and we respond to his laws, and we bring rationality into this discourse when otherwise it's only going to be about power. Mm. So Augustine said, if Christians get involved, I mean, they're the only ones. They are the only ones left who can bring sanity in the midst of this power grab by people yeah. who have nothing in mind except enriching themselves and, and collecting power so that they can set the terms of the debate and decide what they want and oppress everyone else. Yeah, and that's a great point because it, in some ways getting involved is the least selfish thing to do because you're doing it for the benefit of other people who could end up being oppressed by uh, a tyrannical type of, of government or ty tyrannical type of rules. Uh, so that's a, that's a really good point there to think about. So... Uh, I know that a lot of Christians here in America, especially over the last several years, have felt in the past couple of elections or uh, two or three elections that it's really you, you. The choices are just terrible. You you have the lesser. How do you choose the lesser of two evils? At what point do you say I can't vote for anyone? How do you yeah. think through that question? I wrestle through it just like everybody else. I hate it when elections come around, and I think this candidate is a real jerk. And this candidate's really dumb. So how do I choose between those, those two? And how do I make that decision? Well, a friend of mine, Kevin Bywater from the Oxford Study Center helped me articulate this. He said, people always think of elections as choosing the lesser of two evils. In fact, you even hear people say, oh, I held my nose and voted for so-and-so. Kevin puts it this way, and I thought it was really helpful. He said, the goal is not to vote for the lesser of two evils. The goal is to vote in a way that lessens evil. No two candidates are going to be, no candidate is going to be perfect. I mean, even I look back, my favorite president was Ronald Reagan. I thought he was fantastic. But I did see him through rose-colored glasses. There were a lot of things that he took a stand on early in his career that I think led to bad things in our, our nation. When he was governor of California, for example, uh, no fault divorce and abortion on demand. Uh, later, he changed his views on those things, but the damage had been done. So he, even though I really admired him, he was far from being a perfect candidate. Well, from a biblical view, you wouldn't expect any candidate to be perfect. That would not be your goal to find the perfect candidate to vote for. Your goal would be to find people who have some sense of how to lessen evil in the world. That was really one of the first things that, that I focused on. The second thing is I, I'm, I'm going to be focusing, in, and again, this may just be a personal opinion, but I'm just sharing it how, how I look at it. There, there, there's a long tradition in Christian history going all the way back to the Puritans of the spheres of government needing and needing to be balanced with the sphere of family and church. So kind of imagine three balloons in a box. If one balloon, the government balloon gets blown up bigger, it squeezes the family and the church. A proper balance between the family, the church, and the state is always necessary. When I look at 
people who say we're going to expand the role of government to take over what the church and the family used to do, I start to get a little bit suspicious mm -hmm. because a government that can give you everything you want is a government that can take everything you have. So I want to be looking at people who recognize the inherent limits of government and recognize that part of their role as a governmental leader will be to help the family and the church flourish. Now, they're not becoming the church, but they're allowing the church to be the church. And then the church in turn is the conscience of a nation. So I know this all gets really tricky and pastors try to figure out how do I take a stand? How do I preach on all of this? And very often they do uh, what you experienced in that sermon where they just say, well, i People tell me I haven't talked about political issues enough, so I'm going to do it. And I'm, they just blast it all out in <laughs> one sermon, right? And then and no wonder people get the impression that, man, if I go to church, all I'm going to do is hear a political rant. But that doesn't just happen in conservative evangelical churches. Right. If you've been to a mainline you know, Episcopal church or Methodist church, those pastors do the exact same thing, but with a progressive agenda. So it does feel sometimes like, where am I going to go where I can actually hear about the Lord and learn about scripture without having people give me their political opinions from the pulpit? Mm -hmm. Well, if you recognize that balance between government, family, and church, you recognize that you've got, you've got to be a citizen in a way that helps all three of those spheres flourish. That's what makes a flourishing society. That's good. And uh, you made a point just a second ago that's really important, and that's that you know, sometimes the the accusations get lobbed toward one side. But if anyone's watching or listening and you want to actually know some of the statistics behind what Jeff was just talking about, where you see the same thing in mainline churches, you see the same thing in progressive churches. In fact, our friend uh, George Yancey just came out with research showing that uh, progressive Christians tend to uh, focus or they tend to, f their beliefs about the world tend to flow out of their politics, even their theology, rather than the other way around. So if, if anyone wants more more information on that, I re uh, released an episode on w Christian nationalism with Neil Shenby. You can go back and listen to some of the data, some of the research that's been done on that sort of thing to, to understand better what we're talking about here. But I think that's really a great point because it, it seems to me that if I were to, let's say I go on Instagram and I made some sort of a a statement about how the law intersects with abortion or how it intersects with marriage. There is no, absolutely no question in my mind that I would be called a white Christian nationalist by by progressive Christians or by, you know, mostly that's who I inter interact with my page or progressive Christians, not so much atheists and agnostics, but certainly they might as well. Um, and, and it just seems like a really... Um, I don't know, hypocritical position to be in when you're right. Uh, as Neil pointed out, I mean, there were campaign videos shown, like Kamala Harris campaigning, those were shown in hundreds of churches. So so it's not just one side that, you know, that's thinking through politics. Um, and so I, I want to I think this through going back through church history, because you mentioned a few figures. You've mentioned Aquinas. You've mentioned Augustine. Of course, Augustine's, maybe you could call it his magnum opus, the city of God. And um, what can we learn from how Christians have engaged politically going back? I'm even thinking in the first century, um, you know, Christians didn't have political power per se, but they were out, they were the ones rescuing the babies from uh, being left in the in the garbage dumps. They were the ones who were anti-abortion. And, um, you know, they, they uh, I have a podcast on this, how abortion existed back then and Christians were standing against it, whether it was post-birth or pre-birth. Um, what can we learn from church history? Yeah, I, I think the main lesson comes down to this. Those who have an accurate understanding of reality are obligated to express that in every form. And, and not just to express it through their words, but to express it through their actions. You know, Rodney Stark tells this incredible story in one of his books about how it, it, Rome, in Rome, little babies were considered to be worthless. In fact, women and children in general were considered to be of very little value. Slaves were considered to be of very little value. Property owning males were the only ones who had any value. 
And so when a baby would be born, if it was a little boy, well, he had a chance to become a property owning male someday. So they would save him. If it was a little girl and they already had a little girl in the family, they would just throw the child out into the street to be devoured by wild animals. It was Christians who came along and picked up those little babies to care for them in the belief that all human beings, even the ones who weren't desirable by that current society, had value as image bearers of God. Rodney Stark tells that after a while, there was a demographic crisis. There were lots of Roman boys who wanted to get married and they couldn't find girls to marry. So where were the, all the girls? They were in church. They'd been <laughs> raised by the Christians. So the boys went to church. Will you, will you marry me? Well, if I will, if you will become a Christian. That's what Rodney Stark, who's a sociologist and historian, <laughs> calls secondary conversion. <laughs> uh, and it's a, it's a fascinating story of because you, I had always heard, well, the Emperor Constantine decided to become a Christian because he saw that it could give him more political power and make everybody else become Christian. The real story is a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. It goes back to Christians who simply lived out their convictions. There were other times there was a, there was a monk and, and Fox's book of martyrs tells the story about a monk named Telemachus who stood up in the Roman forum and said, it is wrong to put these gladiators in here to fight to the death against one another. And he was killed in, in the Roman forum in front of the crowd. They called for his death. The gladiators killed him. And, but, but John Fox and Fox's book of martyrs says that people realized immediately the horror with what they had done, this monk who had gone in to stand up for their lives and stand against this oppression had been killed. And according to his claim, they walked out of the Roman forum and never came back. That was the last day gladiators were forced to fight to the death for the pleasure of the crowd. So there are lots of fascinating examples from history where these people weren't necessarily in political power, but they had the opportunity to speak up and to be the conscience of the nation. And I really believe that's where we are today with, with strengthening the family, I think standing for life, protecting the lives of the of the unborn uh, there. And there are a lot of other areas as well. Uh, I, I know, for example, when it comes to poverty and oppression, we have poverty, we have oppression in our communities, not nearly as bad as other nations, but still it's something that needs to be addressed. Well, how do you address it? It turns out you could just have the government confiscate more resources and then redistribute them. Or you could encourage people to take initiative and say, start businesses. And, and Elisa, would you believe that in the last four or so years, nearly half of the new small businesses that have been started in the United States were started by people from minority backgrounds. If a, a, an African-American person who starts a small business has 12 times on average more wealth than those who do not start businesses. And these statistics don't just you know, they're not just coming out of my head. These come from yeah. the United States Senate Select Committee on Small Business. It, if you give people opportunity rather than have government take more power and control them and dole out money, then they can lift themselves up. So I'm interested in flourishing. I'm interested in people being able to use their minds to think and to grow. And it does include economics as well, which I know a lot of people find really boring. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people who want to just redistribute the wealth, you hear about that. It's like there's only so much to go around. Remember the materialist view? There's only so much to go around. So you just have to divide the pie up into smaller and smaller pieces to make sure no one has any bigger piece than anyone else. Everybody only has their fair share, right? That's the language that's being used. And, and the Bible comes along and says, why are you trying to divide up that pie into smaller and smaller pieces? Make more pies. You have ideas. You have inspiration. You can innovate. If you have a society where freedom is allowed and people, uh, the barrier to entry and to taking your ideas and doing something, something with them is low, then all kinds of people can prosper. Listen, I don't want to just give jobs. I want people to develop businesses so they can employ other people. That's really the goal, not just getting people to survive and all be equal, but to give people a shot at really doing something that could ultimately benefit humanity in a significant way. What would you say to somebody who is hearing everything you're saying and you're bringing in biblical points, 
and they're saying, you know, you're just trying to make America a Christian nation. You're just uh, trying to impose your morality and your biblical beliefs on non-Christian people. How would you respond to that? I've, I've dealt with that question a lot on college campuses. I usually respond in this way, and it leads to a discussion, maybe not a resolution. But I ask them to think of any law that does not impose some kind of morality. You know, down on the corner near where I'm in my office here, there's a stop sign. Why is there a stop sign there? So that cars will come to a stop. Why? Because if they don't stop, they might enter into traffic in a way that would cause a collision. Why would we care about a collision? Because somebody might be injured. Why would we care whether somebody is injured? Because we believe that human beings have an inherent dignity because they're image bearers of God. We fundamentally believe that. That's why we have stop signs. There's no law that I can think of that does not impose some kind of morality. The question is, whose morality and on what rational basis? So it, it's it. when people say you're just trying to make America a Christian nation, what I'm, I really respond with is I want a flourishing nation. And I want a flourishing nation that flourishes because it's based on reality. At some point, you've got to make some decisions about what is right and what is wrong. Not everything has moral content. I mean, in America, we drive on the right-hand side of the road rather than the left. Other nations do it differently. I'm not saying there's a moral reason to do it on the right as opposed to on the left, but we do have to agree together as a society on, on what we're going to do, on what basis. That's good. Um, when I'm thinking through about engaging politically, it certainly seems like some issues are more important than others. And, you know, when we're talking about theology, we might say there are core essential doctrines. These are things we cannot yeah. agree to disagree on. This is the very definition of what Christianity is. And I assume there's a similar approach in politics because certainly what you think, for example, about human life is not is going to differ in importance than what you might think about the efficacy of masks or something. So help us with, you know, like in theology, how there's these first tier issues and then what might be second tier, third tier. What would you call those in politics? What would be those primary issues that Christians really can't agree to disagree about when it comes to how, it, or if you even think there are those? Uh, I hope this question's making sense. And then what would be those second and third tier issues? You know, the first, the first tier issues to me are issues of life and dignity. That if you've got a society that cannot protect people's dignity and preserve life, then you've got a society that's fundamentally oriented toward collapse. Can you define dignity for, for our viewers and listeners? Uh, yeah. The, so what I mean by, by dignity is a recognition that every human person bears the image of God and that all of our decisions that we make must affirm and build up the image bearing capacity of God. So how we, how we do everything. I mean, here in Colorado, there's a lot of agriculture. A lot of people are in the cattle business, but you know, the way cattle are treated, we know we're going to eat them, you know, kill them and turn them into hamburgers. But that doesn't mean we have to torture them or treat mm -hmm. them wrongly while they're alive. And there's been a significant movement. Well, Temple Grandin, who's a professor at Colorado State University, has been a significant part of this, recognizing that part of our dignity as human beings is our capacity to treat other people with dignity as image bearers of God. And, and the way we treat everybody, even the way we, we treat animals, uh, all of that comes back to affirming at a soul level that we're image bearers of God. So that's that's what I mean by that. So I, to me, uh, I, I just can't bring myself to vote for someone who would advocate abortion on demand up until the point of birth. Okay? I can't do it because if if we know the unborn person, we know the unborn is, uh, fetus is a human, okay? that's There's no question about that scientifically. I believe the unborn are, are persons. And if they're persons, then they may not be deprived of the right to life, liberty, and, and the pursuit of justice and pr property 
without the due process of law. So I, I, if somebody says they can't support the unborn, I can't see how they can defend the Constitution. That's my personal conviction. So to me, that's a first order question. A second order question is flourishing. What kind of what situations do we need to create in our society that open up the possibility of flourishing? So, you know, liberty is negative liberty primarily. How do we keep the government from imposing itself in such a way that people's liberty is shut down? We don't want to have constraints that negate liberty. So I'm thinking of flourishing as in, you know, for right now with, with COVID, uh, all of our national policy is being set by 60 and 70 and 80 year olds to benefit 60, 70 and 80 year olds. Young adults have really been left behind. Young adults are have lost a third to a half a year of education. That significantly reduces their lifetime earning. That reduces their level of income throughout the rest of their lives. That reduces the gross domestic product for the rest of their lives. The level of debt is now so extreme that every kid before they graduate from high school is automatically saddled with $500,000 of government debt before they ever even get to college. That's not sustainable. Nobody's thinking about the rising generation. Uh, there have been 100,000 people die in the last year from drug overdose deaths that, that are mostly among young people. And, and a, the significant increase goes back directly to the national policies that prevented young people from having jobs or engaging in society. There's a direct correlation yeah. there. Uh, you know, when you look at the number of the very few number of young people who've died from COVID and one is too many. But, you know, you're looking at maybe 500 out of the eight or so million people who've who've died around the world. It, it, it's 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 minuscule compared to the number who've died from drug overdoses. You would have to reasonably conclude that our response to COVID has been 20 to 50 times deadlier for young adults than COVID itself. So you, you have to think in terms of human flourishing and you have to think in terms of the rising generation. And then a third, so you asked for three. So first for me, the first priority is life and human dignity. The second one is flourishing. The third level for me is just rationality. Uh, right now, there are so many laws on the books that one attorney examined this and said, on the, every, on the average day, the average American commits three felonies unwittingly because there are so many laws, there's no possible way everybody could obey them. That is irrational. Mm. The administrative state has taken over to the point where it has become actually a form of oppression in and of itself, entirely aside from what elected officials do. So I think we need to take into account the rationality of that. And, and it, it's unjust if you have laws that no one can possibly obey, right? That's good. Yeah, that's, that's a lot to think about. And in a moment, we're going to do a bonus segment where uh, Patreon supporters get to ask the questions. We do a little five to 10 minute hangout afterward. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can go to patreon.com slash Elisa Childers, select tier four to be able to view that, or I'm sorry, tier three will let you uh, view the bonus content. Uh, at tier four, you're going to have opportunities to be a part of a private book club where we read books we disagree with, we discern through them, we try to find out how to interact with this material from a biblical worldview. And there are other tiers available where you can get the episodes early. So again, go to patreon.com slash Elisa Childers. And uh, Jeff, as we close out this portion, um, you know, there's there's a lot we've said here today. And I, I, you know, I want to <laughs> I want to so acknowledge yeah. that, um, you know, that you might be watching this today and you might disagree with us on some things. And that's OK. We um, I, I want to reassure you, I'm not going to be like ch brand changing my branding to become a political platform, but I really did want to give myself first and our viewers and our listeners a good solid theology of politics. How can we be thinking about politics from a biblical and Christian worldview? And Jeff, I think you've done a fantastic job of helping us think through that topic. Uh, but as we close out here, you know, just for, for people who are confused by this culture that just seems to be sending so many different messages, 
it, it, I mean, it is just what a time to be alive, right? <laughs> what a time. Um, what can you leave us with? Just what would be the one takeaway that you would hope everybody would be who is watching this episode would would walk away with? Wow, and I, we've gotten down the weeds a lot on a lot of these topics, but I think what I come back to is we've got to keep in mind that the media has a narrative. Mm -hmm. And it is not necessarily what is going on. We do face a battle in our time, but it's not a battle of Republicans versus Democrats or conservatives versus liberals or red states versus blue states, or even the religious versus the non-religious. It is literally a battle over truth. Does capital T truth exist in a way that can be known by us? Or are we only stuck with small T truths that we socially construct for ourselves? If it's the latter, and the majority of people in the United States of America are now convinced that it is, I see very little hope for our future. If we understand on the other hand that capital T truth does exist and we can discover it, we can discover it through reason and we can discover it through revelation and scripture, then we'll seek to become good theologians and, and understand reality and try to do so in a way that promotes human flourishing. That's great. And you didn't ask me to say this, but you do have a book coming out on that topic, and you're going to come back on the podcast to talk about it. Give us just a two-minute flyover about your book about truth. Well, the truth the book is called Truth Changes Everything, and it comes out later in 2022. I'm excited about it because instead of just making the case for truth, which is, can be very philosophical and bewildering, I decided to go back in history and ask the question, how did Jesus followers, especially in times of crisis, apply their understanding that Jesus is the truth in a way that would transform the world? And it turns out they changed everything for all of civilization in science, the arts, education, justice, politics, even how we get meaning out of our everyday work. Good. Well, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Jeff Myers, for coming on today to tackle this kind of sensitive topic. And again, go to summit.org to find out about opportunities for students this summer. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe and click that bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Also helps if you go over to iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your audio podcasts, leave us a great review, share this on social media. Let's get the conversation going. Let's get this into the news feeds of more people. Thank you so much for watching this week and we'll see you next time.